Well, good morning. Um, I must admit I'm shaking from those first two presentations. Kevin came, came on stage and really told us about what questions we need to ask to make sure that we're having impact. And Ned just blew us away in terms of thinking about exactly how do we measure whether people are really getting water or not. An incredibly important question. I'm here to talk to you about another important question, which isn't so much really how to not change the world, but how to think about changing it from the very, very beginning. And I want to talk about one particular sector. I want to talk about the poor and their money. Because money goes through everything in all of our lives, but particularly in the lives of the poor because they have so little. And so what I want to propose today is that actually, when you start to think about the poor and a fundamental thing like their money, first you really need to understand how they're managing their money in the first place before you start to interfere in ways that might not be appropriate. So I wrote a book with three co-authors called Portfolios of the Poor. And the reason why we embarked upon this journey is because we realized, well, 40% of the world are poor. They live under $2 a day. And when I started to do this work, I was based at the University of Cape Town in the finance department. And I started interviewing people in the townships, trying to understand how they manage their money. And my colleagues said to me, well, that's easy. They don't have any. And I said, have you lost your mind? Because if you don't know better, if you think of $2 a day, you think, oh my god, that is so little money. You must live hand to mouth. There's no way you can save. You must just want loans, because that's all you can really, that's how you can get your hands on money. And that's the only way you can get your hands on money. And we assume the poor cannot have a financial life. Well, we discovered that the exact opposite is true. And we looked very, very carefully at three different countries, Bangladesh, India, and South Africa. And we tracked four households, about 300 of them. We interviewed them every other week for one year. And we tracked all the cash flows coming into their household and all the cash flows coming out. And we truly understood exactly how they managed their money and why and what they were going through as they faced different challenges and pieced together little incomes and little flows. We found, actually, that the poor have very, very rich financial lives. Let me tell you a little bit more about these diaries that we used to track households. It wasn't that households kept their own diary. They didn't keep down everything that we wanted them to sort of keep track of, because that would have been actually very complex. We interviewed them because we wanted every little tiny detail. Now, why was this important? Well, most of the time, when you're designing sort of financial interventions for the poor, you do these big, huge surveys. And they tell you a lot about sort of broad generalities, but you can't really see the lives in that little screen of numbers. On the other spectrum, you could have anthropological surveys. <laughs> And that tells you very, very rich stories, but only a small number of people. And it doesn't always take those same people across time. So Financial Diaries is somewhere in between. It's a research methodology that takes money over time. Because to be honest, that's what finance is. It's a relationship between money and time. And in order to truly understand the finances of the poor, you need to observe, observe them together. Let me talk to you about a couple of lessons that we learned doing these studies. First of all, the poor are actually incredibly active financial managers. My colleagues at the University of Cape Town who said, well, how could they manage their money? They don't have any. That's actually a complete fallacy. The exact opposite is true. Because they have little money, they have to manage it that much more carefully, that much more exactly. The margins are that much thinner, the margin for failure is that much thinner. We found that the poor manage their money actively across a number of different financial devices, at least four, and on average, close to 10. Some of these were formal, like bank accounts. Some of them were semi-formal, like microfinance institutions. And some of them were informal, like giving little loans to neighbors, or being involved in savings clubs. I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. They managed a portfolio of financial instruments in order to match their cash flows. So let me give you an example. This is Hamid and Karaja 
from Dhaka. Hamid is a rickshaw driver, part-time, and his wife, Khadija, takes in sewing from time to time. On average, they earn about $2 per person per day. They live in this room with their three sons. Now, if you were to do a one-off survey of them, if you were to go in and talk to them about how they manage their money, here are the three different devices that you would ask about and that you would expect them to have. You'd expect, I mean, it's Bangladesh. You would expect them to be involved with microfinance institutions one way or another. But when we actually got to know them over a year, here's all the different ways that they manage their money. A lot of them are very informal with each other. Um, there's a certain amount more formality in there than you would expect. And just for people who might think, oh, the poor only want loans, these are all the savings instruments. So the point is here that the poor manage their money very, very actively across informal, informal financial instruments, across savings and borrowing simultaneously. The second lesson is that, you know, poverty isn't just about low incomes. We already know that incomes are low. So they, they have low incomes, but the more important part of this is that those incomes are irregular and unpredictable. You never know when they're going to come. If you have a small business, or if you're a casual worker, you don't know whether you're going to get $2 the next day, or three, or four, or none. If you got $2 every single day, you'd probably actually be way better off than it may sound. So the problem is that incomes are low, that they're irregular and unpredictable, and that, as you can imagine, if you have irregular tools, then it's very difficult to manage that money across time. So the third part of the triple whammy is that the poor actually lack really good tools to manage what cash flows they have. If you think about it, think about the type of, of financial instruments that we have. If we have a regular monthly or biweekly salary, oftentimes we're automatically paid into some sort of um, 401k. We pay insurance automatically. Everything is really taken care of for us. But with these very irregular cash flows, it's very difficult to map financial instruments into irregular cash flows. And the three together mean that $2 a day is actually worse than it sounds. Let me show you an example. This is Pumza. She is one of my favorite respondents, actually. She lives in Lunga, in Cape Town, township outside of Cape Town. She supports herself and four children by selling sheep intestines. That's what you see in front of her, by the side of the road. On average, she earns about $120 a month. To be honest, that doesn't really sound that bad when you think of comparative incomes that you might find in Bangladesh and India. But the thing is, here's her net cash flows, aggregated over two weeks. Pretty choppy. So here's the average. But what on earth does she do during that time and that time when her income peaks so far down when she doesn't sell enough on one day to be able to buy enough fresh stock to sell the next day. Well, she borrows. She borrows from a money lender and she borrows at 30% per month. That's the general township interest rate. But here's another point. She borrows at 30% per month, but she pays back within the month. Thank God she has that money lender because then she's able to keep her business going. She's able to keep food on the table. That money lender is allowing her to manage money to be able to swing around about. Another time when she had income so low that she needed stock to buy the next day, she participated in a savings club with other women who did the same type of business. And it just so happened that on her low day, that was her time to get her payout from that savings club. And those informal mechanisms helped her keep food on the table. They helped her manage that jagged inflow and outflow. It's not just $2 a day. It's that. It's a ragged, jagged $2 a day across which the poor need financial tools in order to keep food on the table, in order to keep themselves going. So one would think that with such ragged incomes and such low incomes, surely the poor cannot save. Surely money just slips through their fingers. And the point about the poor and their money is that commitment and savings is constantly on their mind. You and I, we have 
the pleasure of being able to separate our income from our financial management. For the poor, especially the poor who have small businesses, who are in casual labor, they have to constantly, they have money coming in and coming out. They're not able to make those two separations. They have to be managing money every single day. They don't sit down at the end of the month and think about how they're going to manage their 401k. They have to think about how they're going to hold back money in order to retain stock just in case they don't have money coming in the next day. And that means that they need to save actively. And what tends to work in, poor, in the savings for the poor are commitment savings devices. Formal devices like banks, they don't really have a good mechanism. There's nothing to really pull that money out of cash flows. Savings clubs do, them, do, do it much, much better. However, oftentimes you have problems with savings clubs too. Let me give you an example of a savings club. This is what Numsa does. Numsa lives in the rural areas of South Africa. She's 77 years old. She takes care of four grandchildren, two were from a daughter of hers that, she, that passed away from, from AIDS. And she manages them just on, uh, she manages to feed all of them just on a government grant of about $115 per month. Believe it or not, she saves $40 a month. How does she do it? She has two different savings clubs. Here's one of them, and here's how it works. She and her neighbors get together, and each month, they each contribute $9 into the kitty. The treasurer takes all that money home, and frankly, she sticks it under her mattress. The next month, they get together again, and each contributes $9. At the end of the year, they each take home just under $100. It is in this way that she saves 35% of her income. The trick with these savings clubs is that you are compelled, because they're your neighbors, they're your friends. You have to contribute. You'd be ashamed if you didn't. Sometimes you'll go without some food in order to make sure that you saved face and you contributed to the savings club as you were supposed to. It's a really effective commitment device. But here's where these clubs fail. What if somebody stole, stole the money from under the mattress of the treasurer? What if somebody ran off with it? What if, as often happens, they lent out this money? Again, at 30% per month, I mean, my goodness. You know, some of these savings clubs could be, you know, mini hedge funds. But the problem is, do you always collect back those loans? I had one respondent who was, belonged in a savings club like this, and when they were taking all the money and they were ready to distribute it, one person who was carrying half the money was actually robbed and shot and killed. And that particular respondent was out most of her savings that she had painfully contributed to for an entire year. So one of the problems with savings clubs is that they can be unreliable. They can go badly, badly wrong. So one of the propositions that I come with you today is to say, look, the poor actually manage their money very actively. Oftentimes they manage it very well. They can be very clever with their money. So let's not think that we're taking any microfinance product or any savings product into absolutely virgin territory. The poor are already managing their money. You're adding another financial product into the suite of products they're already managing. You need to be aware of that because you might be disrupting the portfolio one way or another. However, that's not to say that these portfolios behave well. That's not to say that they're safe, that they always provide that type of mechanism that they need. So I want to leave you with three points. First of all, that poor households manage their money more intensely, not because incomes are so high, but because incomes are so low. When you have less money, you need to manage what you have that much more carefully. And you think about it all the time. You constantly think about where your money is going to next. The second thing is that the hidden tragedy of poverty is that the poor don't have the tools that they really, really need to be able to manage that money well. We come in from the outside, we come in from a Western culture, from a more um, monthly salaried culture, and we provide financial products that, they, that we think are right. We say to ourselves, 
oh, it, everything must be about transaction costs. We must provide cheap financial products. We must provide, we must get everybody into a savings account without really looking at how the poor are managing their money already to try to pick up the clues about what's working and what isn't working. So how do we avoid the type of situations that Kevin and Ned spoke about earlier? The answer is know your client. Know who you're dealing with. Know what they're doing already. And then truly understand where the gaps are. What we're hoping in the financial sector is that from here, we're starting to scale up some of the things that work very well. Mobile and agent banking. It means a flexibility that the poor don't really have now. It gives them a huge liquidity to take the money out of the mattress and maybe into a cell phone where it's private, where they can access it easily. At the same time, we're exploring different commitment devices that act a lot like NUMS's savings device. That mechanism works, works very well, but let's try to improve the reliability. The next steps are to try to innovate and imagine the types of financial products that the poor can use and that will help improve their lives. Thanks very much.